This episode is going to look at the rise of tyrants in ancient Greece and explore the reasons that allowed them to seize power. Around 800 BC, Greece emerged from a dark age and the period that followed is known to us as Archaic Greece. And it's at this time, during the 7th century BC, that these events took place. At this time, Greece was divided into independent city-states. And, although kings still existed in Greece, most city-states were ruled by an oligarchy. This was government exclusively run by a small number of rich and powerful families. They were the nobility, also known as the aristocracy. They exclusively held offices within the government, and these positions gave them the powers to administer justice, agree on treaties, and even declare war. In warfare, they also monopolised the leadership within the military, and it was the nobility that formed the ranks of the cavalry. They also lived very wealthy lifestyles, with far greater land holdings than the average man. However, by the 650s BC, the nobility began to lose their monopoly on political power, as they were increasingly replaced by a single ruler. These were the tyrants. The use of the word tyrant in ancient Greece at this time wasn't necessarily a cruel or oppressive ruler like we think of today. At this time, a tyrant was a single ruler that had usurped the existing regime. So, how did the nobility lose their hold on power? Well, the most important factor in answering this question was a significant change in warfare. The Hoplite Revolution. The infantry adopted a much larger shield that measured three feet across. The most revolutionary adaptation about the shield was a double grip inside the rim, which allowed the soldier to carry such a large shield with just one hand. Using the left hand to carry the shield, the right hand was then free for spear thrusting or for the use of a short range sword. The head was protected by a metal helmet and metal greaves protected his shins. He also wore a metal padded linen breastplate for added protection to his body. The large shield would protect the soldier from his chin to his knees. The infantry would then line up in formation with their shields overlapping. Each man's shield would protect the man to his right, creating a solid shield wall, which could not be charged down by cavalry. This put the emphasis of warfare on the common infantry soldier and diminished the role of the cavalry. The Hoplite style of fighting was not introduced by the nobility. It first appeared on the Greek mainland in Argos under a king named Theoden in the 670s BC. But once the Argives began to use it, they held the advantage in war and so the other city-states had to follow suit to remain competitive. The Hoplite Revolution changed the balance of power in Greece. The new Hoplite citizens could now band together, take up arms to defend their farms from raiders, and so they no longer needed to rely on the nobility and their cavalry for local protection. A service that the nobility had charged their citizens in the form of a taxation, and one that was no longer needed. More importantly, however, a potential tyrant could call upon the common hoplite soldier against his political rivals to gain power. The second problem the nobility faced was one of their own making. The nobility tended to be extremely ambitious and competitive with one another, developing rivalries and factions within their own class. The causes of these disputes tended to be disappointment and resentfulness when missing out on a particular office or honour. This would lead to verbal insults, feuds, and they would even challenge each other to duels armed with swords and spears. However, once the new hoplite style of warfare had been introduced, the nobility increasingly urged the common hoplite citizen to take up arms to settle these internal feuds, raising the stakes and the level of bloodshed involved. To make matters worse, there was also what I would call the colony effect. By that time, the Greeks had set up independent colonies all around the Mediterranean, 
and as a result, there was an increase in new luxuries and goods imported from outside the Greek mainland. This created a new source of status symbols and riches that the nobility could use to display their wealth and social standing, and basically lorded over one another. This increased financial pressure within their ranks, and only fed into their rivalries and feuding. This financial pressure to make further profits often encouraged the nobility to abuse their positions of power, particularly when it came to administering justice by accepting bribes. They were often also in the business of money lending, loaning to the poorer classes, and in order to increase their income further, they would impose crippling interest on the debts owed to them. When the debt became too much to pay, they would confiscate property and force those they lent to into slavery. However, their corruption only encouraged the poorer hoplite citizens to take up arms against the nobility in support of a potential tyrant who promised fairer justice and laws. The nobility were not businessmen, traders or craftsmen. These trades they considered vulgar. Instead, slaves would conduct these activities on their behalf. There were, however, independent traders from the lower classes, who became extremely wealthy taking advantage of the nobility's need for overseas imports. Therefore, a number of new prominent families from the lower classes emerged, gaining wealth by trade. And although they knew they would never be accepted as part of the nobility due to the class that they were born into, they did, however, feel that because of their newly acquired wealth, that they too were capable of running for political office. This only increased competition for the limited offices available, and only added discord within the nobility. Once a tyrant had gained power, he could then create more offices and enlarge the councils, filling them with new families loyal to him, diluting the power of the nobility further still. So, what were the effects of tyrants on Greek society? The power grab of a tyrant could stop violence and bloodshed caused by feuding nobles. And, in order to gain support from the hoplite citizens, a tyrant may have introduced policies for fairer justice and laws that protected citizens from slavery by debt. Tyrants had far greater wealth than their nobles and erected temples and public buildings to display their wealth. They also created much larger naval fleets, strengthening their city. As well as this, they patronised poets and the arts on a much larger scale than the nobles had. However, tyrants would consider their tyranny as a position of inheritance to pass down to their sons. Inevitably, their heirs may have been less discreet, less capable or less suited for the position they held. As a result, many states experienced rulers that were either corrupt, incompetent, weak or even cruel. Due to this, city-states went through civil war, bloodshed and revolution to rid themselves of these rulers. One of these revolutions, in the city-state of Athens, gave birth to a new political experiment, democracy. But that's a story for another time. To conclude this episode, by the end of the Archaic period, most cities either reverted back to an oligarchy or adopted a new democratic system. As for the tyrants, well, they weren't completely eradicated, and the threat and fear of tyranny remained, as the word became associated with an oppressive and cruel ruler, as it is today.